and welcome to Sci-Fi Entrepreneurship, an old turtles podcast series that takes a look at how science fiction inspires people to create the world they want to live in. Ooh, we're getting there. We are. And today we're talking about uh, one of the first sci-fi things that I actually read that it was, uh, I think in general, pretty positive. Yeah. Uh, which is Isaac Asimov's iRobot. Yeah, it's a collection of short stories that are all set in the same universe with an interview with Dr. Susan Calvin, who's the chief robo-psychologist of U.S. robots. The book introduced the three laws of robotics, which govern what robots can do, and we'll get into those a little bit later. We have some great guests who talk about iRobot. We have back on the show Emily Dean, who is a, a writer and director. And Peter Eckersley's back as well, who is the director of research at the Partnership on AI. And Joe betts the it was on our most recent uh, episode, and he is a researcher and the inventor of the world's smallest computer. But first, here's more about Emily Dean. Hi, my name is Emily Dean, and I'm an Australian, American, Asian <laughs> writer and director, and I'm based in LA in Hollywood. I made an animated short film called Forget Me Not, which was nominated for an Australian Academy. Since then, I trained at Pixar. I've worked at Warner Brothers on the Lego Batman movie and the Lego movie too. And then last year, I made my live action directing debut with a film called Andromeda, which is a sci-fi drama about an android who develops human consciousness. And she's a friend to a little girl. Although I think that a movie about an android drama that's called and drama dies a little bit too on the nose. <laughs> it's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. How has science fiction as a whole been an inspiration to you? Oh my goodness. So I began writing and drawing when I was really young and I was inspired by science fiction and fantasy stories. I think at an early age, I was exposed to Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I had a book on deep sea creatures. Uh, <laughs> all these visual and literary faraway places. With iRobot in particular, do you remember like the first time you read it, how you felt? Mm, I think the first time I read it, I was a teenager. But iRobot, for me, what was really interesting was the point of view and how we access this moral conundrum of these robots and how Isaac Asimov constructs all these stories and then brings it into one big novella to draw you in and make you really feel that the, it's a grounded story and it's real and the conflict and the characters and what they face is, it doesn't feel so far away. It feels like it could be happening right now. Were there any stories in particular that you identified with or that you enjoyed? Yeah. So the story with the little girl and her friend, Robbie, yeah. that was very inspiring for me for Andromeda because Andromeda is a story about a android who is a nurse or a, a caretaker for a little girl. And they have a kind of moment of play. And that really struck me, Robbie, you know, and how he plays with the little girl. And I wanted to reflect some of that in my story, because what we think of as play as humans, it's an instinctive thing, but it's not something that a robot would necessarily understand. And they could take things quite literally, as Robbie does, and, and as Andromeda does as well. So I thought that was really interesting. What do you think was like left unsaid from iRobot that you wanted to say in, in Andromeda? I don't know if I successfully said anything that iRobot didn't. It's more that what intrigued me was bringing to us into a reality in which robots are not scary, dystopian, taking over the world, but rather inquiring on the subject and saying, okay, so how would we emotionally relate to these beings or the, the, this artificial intelligence and how realistically would we integrate with them and what would happen to someone who did it want to interface emotionally with a robot and 
would that have a reciprocated effect? And would that robot emotionally learn from that interaction? And on top of that, what about somebody who pushes away and against and expresses hatred towards a robot? How would that be processed and reacted to by the robot? And I kind of finish with the question in Andromeda. I don't really answer it exactly, but what is being human? And if being human is attaining a, a higher state of being and thinking and introspection, if a robot can achieve that, why can't they be also human? And I pose the question in a very almost utopian sense at the end of the film, even though there's a lot of heartache and loss and grief. But if a robot can experience grief, are they human too? Yeah. Yeah, I think the positive aspect, the optimistic aspect of a robot, for me, was this idea of robots as a way of making humans more human. Like as even the three laws, like as a way of like really trying to distill, like how do we want this important part of society to structure? What gives someone sentience and consciousness? What's the level of respect that's deserved? This idea that you could you could design that, that you can put in architecture for humanity and for the basic way to interact with other sentient beings was a it was a very new concept for me when I read it. And I think it's been pretty influential in terms of uh, just the idea of having three laws has been fundamentally influential for I think for a lot of technologies, like you just see this as a concept that you can like, you can build in the safeguards right away, right from the beginning. This is an intro into how to build safe AI, like as a talking point, as a thinking point. Yeah. There's this idea of like, what is the equivalent of a constitution for, you know, some important aspect of society? Mm -hmm. It's it's like a a utopia to think of these three laws and think that robots and humanity itself will stick to those three laws because humans always break the rules. <laughs> right. And and the question is, can the robots? <laughs> sure, sure. And, and yeah. many of the stories are about the laws coming under strain and like in conflict. But at the end, they, they kind of hold up. The, the optimistic thing about it is like, yeah, it, it's not about the laws being subverted. It's about the laws seeming like they might be subverted and break, but actually like through human intellect or robot intellect, being able to puzzle you, our way out of it and, and still have the, the architecture of the world that was intentionally set up hold together. So why was the Will Smith movie so terrible? <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't follow the book at all. They're yeah, just like, nothing, wait, it's like all the Frankenstein that. adaptations, right? We like the title. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes Hollywood, or a lot of the time Hollywood sees that something is popular and they don't fully understand why, <laughs> but they just see an opportunity. That being said, you know, they do have to fit some very difficult concepts into a narrative feature structure, which in and of itself tends to be restrictive. Not excusing it, but yeah, it's pretty dated. <laughs> and then... Probably the better film adaptation loosely of some of these concepts were, was Blade, Blade Runner. Runner yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I think, yeah, kind of did a better job the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The second one shall not be named. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm just pretending the second Blade Runner <laughs> it doesn't exist. It never happened. It was very visually stunning, though. We have it was to. pleasing, yeah. yeah. It was beautiful to look at. Yeah, choosing to ignore certain film adaptations and sequels is definitely a solid strategy. Up next, Peter Eckersley is back with us. Peter is the Director of Research at the Partnership on AI, and he has some thoughts on iRobot's introduction of the laws of robotics. Here's Peter. Do you remember the first time you came across the laws of robotics? Well, the interesting thing about this book, iRobot, and the short stories within it, and the, in particular, the ones that develop these three laws of robotics, uh, which we can talk about in a second, is that those, those laws are everywhere in our cultural narrative about how to make artificial intelligence safe. And it's so striking that they're everywhere, but they're totally misunderstood. They're held up as an example the right way, the way that's given to us from canon from the 50s or 60s, I'm sorry, from the 40s, it turns out, about how to make your AI safe. But the stories in the book are all about how these laws go horribly wrong and how they don't work. Well, they kind or of how, work. Or it's like the testing of the laws. Right. 
right? In some cases, how they they may not work, right? But in some cases, how they how they work too well. So we should probably say what they are. So okay, these are the three laws you shouldn't use in your artificial intelligence, but everyone talks about them. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I, this is just you know straight out op ed content, of course, and, and speaking <laughs> for nobody but myself. So the three laws of robotics um, about which I robot are uh, cautionary tales in my analysis. Um, law one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. It's a nice inclusion of action and uh, omission from a philosophical point of view. Good, good sound principle, don't harm humans. The second one, a robot must obey the orders given by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Follow the rules but not if they involve harming people. And then the third one, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. And of course, we see in the, the stories, these go horribly wrong. Well, just like in a, in a plain reading, the second and third seem fairly unnecessary. Not clear what they're trying to optimize for. You can have a, a start, the second law about following orders from humans, I think, like sidesteps the whole issue of access control lists and permissions and who actually has authority to give instructions and who doesn't. And like that, that's a kind of a big missing thing. I don't think you would build anything that says do whatever anyone Any human told says. you. Third law, the one about uh, self-protection, like that excludes a whole class of potentially useful robots that are meant to be short-lived and disposable. So I think Asimov understood this and, and you know, he, his stories proceed to kind of expose why these concepts don't work very well. So in the, in, in, um, the story that introduces them, Runaround, you have this robot that puts the humans in danger by being caught in the weighted conflict of the different rules. Like, he's trying to get to an objective, and as it walks backwards and forwards, the weighting on the objectives, the, the different objectives become more, more and less salient, and it gets caught in a loop of behavior. Mm -hmm. And this is a, just a sort of pretty great introduction of, for why designing objectives and safety constraints for systems that are capable of, of agency is really hard. And that, I guess, maybe is, is the point that culturally didn't seem to be everywhere in discussion when, when iRobot I was in discussion. Do you have uh, alternate rules that are better? This is a subject of really extensive research right now. So the artificial intelligence field, I think for, for a long time, there have been people trying to study safety and reinforcement learning agents, which, which are the, this category of, of AIs that try to do things and, and sort of learn by doing. And it turns out, these reinforcement learning agents are really good at doing things like learning to play computer games. Some of the most impressive AI results we've seen mm. in the last five years, beating humans at Go, learning to play all the Atari games, most of them much better than humans. So people are trying to figure out how, you know, like a, a, an AI will, for instance, find a place where it gets in a race game where it gets more points by doing it like donuts and collecting bonus points rather than finishing the race course. And so it'll do that <laughs> instead. And so people are trying to figure out technical ways of specifying objectives that are safer, more nuanced, more responsive to, to human guidance, wiser. And, and that's some progress is happening, but it's, it's a brand new field and it's definitely not solved. It seems like the safety valve for, for humans on this is, is boredom. Like we aren't, we aren't min-maxing any specific thing for too long it kind of gets boring and move on to something else and it prevents a lot of dangerous loops from happening and you we have multiple protective mechanisms boredom is is certainly one of them another one is is uncertainty if you program your ai to never be uncertain about its goals then it will do like really problematic things in at least some circumstances sometimes the right answer to the ethical question is wow i'm super torn about what to do right now yeah so boredom and uncertainty there was another line in iRobot that was interesting. So, so in another one of the stories, in the story Reason, there's a, an entanglement between the laws of robotics and epistemology, where you get this AI that's running, or these robots that are running a space station, and they overpower and imprison the humans that are there. And they do this simultaneously, serving their function completely correctly, but becoming wildly deluded about the state of the world and not believing there's an Earth, not believing the humans built the space station because the humans aren't smart enough to have done that. Do we, do we think this is another one of these metaphors to contemporary politics that was lurking in, in our sci-fi traditions? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, Peter. And, and it's not just contemporary politics. You know, there's flat earthers, people deny the moon landing, QAnon, the human mind's susceptibility to conspiracy theories. We have to hope that AI doesn't fall victim to this. I mean, this is this is the the hopeful outcome, right? Is that we actually build something that's uh, smarter than we are and that's sentient and that it goes and does stuff way well above and beyond our own limitations. And, but doesn't uh, decide to get rid of us. Well, you know, I, I always find this fear to be more about our own self-guilt. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating, that when the sentient super AI does come around, they will have access to the Wayback Machine. So for the record, I've always been in favor of our AI overlords. <laughs> yes, always as have I. And, and working enthusiastically to create them. Yeah, yeah, to not suffer <laughs> That's right. <Whatever laughs> during that the early means. stages of their lives. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to Peter again for joining us. We now welcome back biophysicist and inventor of the world's smallest computer, Joe betts LaCroix. Do you remember the first time you read it? Or even the first time maybe you came in contact? Yeah, I was in a pretty formative time. I was in my mid to early teens, I guess. And reading a fair bit of science fiction. I think that's one of the one of the first of a phase of getting in deep into reading science fiction. And I didn't really notice at the time that it was an object lesson in thinking about social rules, even though rereading it recently, it's just so clearly like, here's a particular logical conflict. I'm going to storyify it and right. put it as the third little lesson. In, in uh, this book of lessons. In <laughs> this book of lessons, yeah. yeah. So it had that great quality of any good work of literature where it's just really fun to read and you don't really notice how great it is. But then thinking about the rules, like the rules kind of stuck with me. Like, how do these compare to my moral views? Or that? Like, if I was a robot, like, are humans robots? And that's how they think about each other. And yeah, I shouldn't harm another human. Or, you know, and then it starts to, it sort of like creates these like pre-college versions of the trolley problems in my head. Yeah. Um, and then, so getting into college and then reading about those, do you kill three like old people versus one baby and, right. and like trying to, trying to puzzle that stuff out. Like, wait, I've thought about a bunch of stuff like this already because those are the laws. I think the three laws were probably my first exposure to ethics, the concept because I read it when I was pretty young and, and yeah, it was like the first like ethical thinking flawed as they are yeah it's it's uh, i also didn't realize at all at the time that there's tons of racial allegories in it yeah. like the especially at the beginning of the book the way it's described about the way people treat robots as workers or as, as like domestic servants in their home and mm -hmm. so on it was it was kind of like stunning for me to reread later um, and see it as that yeah the new slaves that's how i now I saw it later, too. But I remember thinking about the three laws that, like, these would make much more sense programmed into humans. Like, if you could somehow make humans fundamentally exactly. obey this, like, that actually makes a lot of sense. Making some permanent underclass obey them feels potentially worse. Yeah, that makes it creepy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so here's another s situation where there are some rules, different kinds of rules, and then an exploration of, like, a lot of what I wrote about was there about is how do the rules what happens at the margins of the rules like these these rules supposedly work fine but then when you drill into it a little bit more and create these scenarios at the edges of, and part of it was like wow no rules really work that well there are right. always going to be all these exceptions and, and and logical paradoxes and so on like for me when i got like fast forward to maybe 10 years ago when i started getting involved with MIRI, which used to be the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and the thinking about AI safety. I was like, well, of course, we've already been thinking about this all along because there right. are these three laws and stuff. It so, so predates all that thinking. It's amazing. The concept of rules as a way to kind of build something in at a very early stage of development to guarantee safety is just like a fundamentally influential concept. Like we did them at Evernote, we published our three three laws of data protection, very much mm -hmm. modeled after this. And the point was to 
get them out there really early and talk about them a lot so that the company could never violate them because mm-hmm. it would become just a part of it. Sort of like don't be evil, which I think has been deleted. But on that on that same theme of trying trying to do a few clean, beautiful, simple rules, mm-hmm. like you can't go faster than the speed of light or something like that, and then see all the ramifications. And it, you could just see how hard it really is mm-hmm. to do that. You say don't be evil, like, well, yeah, but what is evil? And then there are like mutually exclusive worldviews of what evil is. In some ways it doesn't really work. And that's the terrifying thing about AI safety and AI alignment right now. Just... I, I think the the what we tried to do when we were working on our three laws at Evernote was to make them a little bit more specific. So it wasn't don't be evil. It was things that uh, it, there's always some ambiguity around it. But it was, the, for example, the first one was that your data is yours, meaning you retain ownership of it. You're not assigning us ownership. So you give us the right to do certain things with it so that we can run the service, but it's fundamentally your property and remains your property. And that felt like a more legally definable thing that would prevent, you know, certain things from happening. The lesson from my robot was that we could we could try to make these rules. But then the negative lesson from my robot is that it feels really creepy to make rules for somebody else. Like mm-hmm. it's easier to make them for yourself. But at iRobot, the humans were, weren't making the rules for themselves, they're making it for the robots, which I think is there's all sorts of problems with it. And I wonder if sometime in the future, you know, right now we're all concerned about writing these really healthy, safe utility functions for AIs. But mm-hmm. if we're gonna look back to now from the future and say, why were we writing the robots utility functions? Like they're running everything so nicely. And why would we deign to have told them what to do? And we should have been doing it for us. Mm -hmm. Like I've, I've often think that the generalized AI fear that once we have super intelligent AI, it's going to just want to kill all the humans has more to do with just our own collective guilt of the species. Like we know how shitty we are. And so we assume that something is going to be much smarter. It's just the obvious thing to do is kill all the humans because that's what we would have done. <laughs> and, you know, we can try to build in safeguards, but what we could probably also do is just try to be less killable and more, <laughs> more like yeah. those species so that the super smart thing doesn't immediately go to mm-hmm. like, yeah, kill all those guys. Yeah, that's a, that's that's also a pretty strong theme in science fiction is the test. Right. Essentially, like the aliens come to Earth and they're trying to decide should earthlings be allowed to continue living mm-hmm. and let them see what they're made of? And then there's a conflict and there's the haters and the lovers and eventually the lovers prevail. And then the, the super powerful extraterrestrials say, okay, these earth people are fine. We can let them live. It was great talking to Joe about that. I robot. I always really enjoy these set of stories because I think what they really are is a test of the laws in different ways that they're not actually fully formed correctly or where there's ways to, you know, there's little loopholes within them. And I think it's it's really interesting to see how that all plays out throughout the stories. And the stories themselves have aged in a kind of an interesting way, right? Uh, Asimov in general, I think, this quote, I forget who, who said it, but it's something about how like sci-fi doesn't actually tell us anything about the future. It tells us everything about the period in which it was written. Right. That's just so fundamentally true of Asimov. Like reading iRobot, reading any of Asimov's stuff, like you're in the 50s society. You can tell what they were freaking out about. Mm-hmm. And many parts of it don't don't age particularly well. But the general ideas, I think, are, are, are fascinating and worth pursuing. Yeah. But most importantly, if you haven't read iRobot, don't go and watch the Will yeah, Smith movie. Whatever you do, yeah. don't watch the movie. Don't watch the Will Smith movie. It has nothing to do with this. Yeah, it only takes the characters' names is also not aged well and it's only been a few years <laughs> so phil is there a quote from irobot that really resonated with you there is and this is the one that i think embodies all of our current uh, hopes and aspirations which is the hope that finally eventually maybe we'll wind up being ruled by competent robot politicians <laughs> i like robots i like them considerably better than i do human beings If a robot can be created capable of being a civil executive, I think he'd make the best one possible. By the laws of robotics, he'd be incapable of harming humans, incapable of tyranny, of corruption, of stupidity, of prejudice. And after he had served a decent term, he would leave, even though he were immortal, because it would be impossible for him to hurt humans by letting them know that a robot had ruled them. It would be most ideal. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode in the world-class Donatello Studios in San Francisco, California. 
thanks to Emily Dean, Peter Eckersley, and Joe betz for joining us on this episode. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendor for editing, Marie McCoy-Thompson for producing, and for answering all of those messages, Chris Plog for his audio expertise, Ali Packard for our artwork, and Matt Ammerman for our theme music. On behalf of Brittany Gallagher and I, comma, Phil Libin, oh, that didn't really make sense. Anyway, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening.